second to click on. Okay. Are you good? Is everyone ready? Okay. Good evening, everybody. It is six o'clock, so I will call this regular meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education to order. Uh, Ms. Uh, Jackson, good evening to you. Would you please take roll? Good evening. Marilyn Clark. Present. Amanda Ferguson. Present. Amy Green. Present. Jason Moore. Present. Tyler Murphy. Present. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jackson. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us for tonight's meeting, both in person and online. Our next item on the agenda uh, will be Board Member Marilyn Clark leading us through the observation of moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance and the reading of our district mission statement. Board Member Clark. Good evening. Tonight, we would like to acknowledge the tragic deaths of two members of the Fayette County Public Schools family, including Kenlon Johnson, a 17-year-old student at the Success Academy who also attended Mary Todd Elementary School, Winburn Middle School, Bryan Station High School, and the Audrey Grievous Center, and Carter Underwood, a junior at Bryan Station High School who also attended Booker T. Washington Academy, Sandersville Elementary, and Leestown Middle Schools. Our hearts remain with their families, their friends, and all those they touched, and they were touched by their passing. Please join me in a moment of silence. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I'd like to share the mission with you. The mission of the Fayette County Public Schools is to create a collaborative community that ensures all students achieve at high levels and graduate prepared to excel in a global society. Thank you, uh, Board Member Clark. Uh, before we get into tonight's meeting, I do want to pause uh, quickly to acknowledge a member of our staff, uh, Heidi Reitag. Where are you, Heidi? <laughs> Stand up, Heidi. Uh, this is Heidi's last Monday board meeting, and I know she's distraught about it. In her current role over facilities, she'll be moving on as director of maintenance for Fayette County Public Schools. But, uh, but Heidi, we are grateful to you for everything that you've done to help us get organized um, and uh, you know, to make sure you're going out with a bang. We are having a closed session tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll try to keep it short. But no, we appreciate you, and we know that you will do great things over in uh, maintenance, but you will certainly be missed here. And as we chatted before, at the beginning of the meeting, you're welcome to come any Monday evening, but I'm sure you'll be glad to have those Mondays off. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next order of business is the adoption of our agenda. Um, I have been informed that we need to pull and table item J9 on the consent agenda, the lease agreement for Meadowbrook Golf Course. Um, so with that request, I will entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for tonight's meeting with item J9 uh, set aside uh, for later action. Is there a motion to that effect? I move we accept tonight's agenda with J9 uh, moved for a later agenda. Thank you very much. A motion by Board Member Green. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Board Member Moore. Questions on approval of the agenda? Uh, with consent item J9 uh, postponed. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Uh, we like to open our school board meetings by spotlighting our talented students in high quality arts instruction. Tonight we'll be treated to a performance by the Lafayette Magical Singers under the leadership of Director of Choirs Ryan Marsh and the School for the Creative and Performing Arts Vocal Instructor and Director Laura Howard at this time. I'd like to ask our FCPS Director of Fine Arts, Ms. Catherine Lowther, to come forward and tell us more. Thank you. 
Good evening, members of the board, Dr. Liggins and guests. Happy Youth Arts and Music in Our Schools Month. Tonight we're featuring the Lafayette High School Madrigal Singers under the direction of Ryan Marsh. This ensemble performs high quality choral repertoire from all time periods and styles with an emphasis on world music and contemporary choral literature. I'll turn it over to Lafayette Choral Director Ryan Marsh and Senior Zaid Alkatani to share more about the program and context of the piece. Thank you members of the Board of Education and Dr. Liggins. Uh, I'm really excited to share one of our pieces that we performed for both the Kentucky Music Educators and the American Choral Directors Conferences in February. The Lafayette Madrigal Singers are one of only three high school choirs in Kentucky to have performed for ACDA in the past 40 plus years, and the only ensemble invited more than once. This is a testament to the meaningful commitment the singers have demonstrated to each other and to the music. They have made sacrifices of time and resources to strive for artistic excellence and to create powerful connections both within the walls of Lafayette High School and beyond. Tonight's piece, Ela Rotan, is an Indonesian folk song featuring Indonesian musical colors and elements alongside modern techniques and harmonies. Ela Rotan is from the island of Maluk or Malukas and tells of the traditional game of tug of war. El Arotan upends our notion of competition by focusing on the reward of togetherness. This really exemplifies what we try to instill in our students, not only in choir, but in all of our arts programs at Lafayette. Our focus on collaboration and nurturing a community of artists is the goal. In this performance of El Arotan, we share our belief in the spirit of unity, that we are stronger working together despite our differences than when we're alone. So one of our seniors, senior members, Zaid Akatani, would like to share what the opportunity to collaborate with a community of artists means to him. Hi, my name is Zaid Akatani, and I'm a senior at Lafayette. I've been in choir and band for four years. The opportunity to sing and showcase our talent for groups of music educators was a terrific honor and a great opportunity to reach for excellence. On a personal note, we have learned to come together as an ensemble and as a community of artists. I remember when we did an activity in rehearsal and Mr. Marsh asked us to raise our hands for our favorite moments of a piece where we had unlimited hand raises. There was at least one hand that was raised for most of the piece. And what it taught us was that although we are many individuals, we have to commit to becoming an ensemble, to work together and to give our very best at every moment not only to do justice to the music, but also to respect each other's commitment and love for it. We have all learned a lot of great lessons through our experiences in Lafayette music and arts programs. Thank you, and please enjoy the Lafayette High School Madrifull performance of Hela Rotan. <laughs> Oh, 
excellent job. Thank you both so much for being here, and not only um, for the performance, but to, to explain it and to share Her. Zade, your, Her. your passion as well. Um, and incredible job with the Magical Singers. What instrument do you play in the orchestra? Or band? you're in band? Yes, I play the bass clarinet. Okay, excellent, very good, very good. Well, we appreciate you being here and sharing this with us. Mr. Marsh, thank you for what you do for our kids as well. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And at this time, I'll turn the agenda over to Superintendent Liggins for the Superintendent's Report. Thank you very much, Chair Murphy, and my compliments to Ryan, Laura, and the students from Lafayette High School as well. So um, I can certainly see why you guys were selected to perform at the Kentucky Music Educators Association. So uh, also, I'd like to do a warm welcome to all those in the audience this evening, in addition to those joining us online. Before we get started with the superintendent's report this evening, I would like, in honor of Women's History Month, to debut the FCPS um, Women's History um, video that's been made. Um, as you are all aware, um, education is a field that is predominantly women, and um, we wanted to make sure that we took some time to honor um, women in special places that help make our district what it is. So, no further ado, could we see the video, please? Her. 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 As a Hispanic female educator, I have been with Fayette County Public Schools for 10 years. It's an honor and a privilege to teach little girls who look like me. My name is Dr. Lizette Rogers, and this is Her Story. I've been with Fayette County Public School Police Department for a total of 18 years in a field where women make up less than 13% of the total population. I believe it's important to have women in leadership roles so we can continue to empower other women I'm Sergeant Alisa Scott, and this is her story. I'm a collision repair technician. I've been doing this for 11 years. The intensity of the job is a challenge. It's fun, and I do this because it shatters the stereotype that a woman can't do a man's job. My name is Felicia Ashcraft, and this is her story. I've been with Fayette County Public Schools for 16 years. I'm the college and career coach at Bryan Station High School, and I do this work to empower young women who look like me to explore their potential and believe in their gifts. My name is Brandi Ashford, and this is Her Story. I have been a member of the Fayette County Public Schools family for nine years. I am in my first year as a head principal, and I am absolutely honored to be the first female principal of Tates Creek High School. I love being an educator because I love for all of our students to see what they can achieve, and especially for our female students. It is such an honor for me to be an example to them and show them what they can achieve. I'm Dr. Christy Field, and this is her story. I'm an agriculture teacher at Locust Trace AgriScience Center. I've been here for about three years now, and serving in this role helps me feel like I'm empowering and teaching the future of agriculture. I'm Graciela Barajas, and this is her story. always thank you Robert and your team for such quality service and videos. Um, next on the superintendent's report in keeping with the theme of Women's History Month, our um, spotlight this month will be our Sister Keeper, um, an exciting mentoring program at Bryan Station High School. It was also the recipient of the 2023 um, Golden Apple Award. So at this time, Miranda Scully, I see you're making your way forward. That's, um, is Whitney Young with you as well? Okay, Whitney Young, and who is the Youth Service Center Director at Bryan Station High School, and Andrea Baker, our Advancement via Individual Determination AVID Coordinator. Um, ladies. Thank you, Dr. Liggins. Good evening, board and audience. Tonight, I'm very happy to um, introduce the Sister Keeper Program at Bryan Station High School. 
They were recognized as a 2023 Golden Apple Award recipient in the school-based organization category. Since 2019, Sister Keeper has mentored over 250 young women in topics such as self-esteem, positive affirmations, academic transitions, mental health, self-care, and empowerment. It is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Baker, the AVID Site Coordinator, and Whitney Young, Youth Service Center Coordinator, both of Bryan Station High School. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Just go ahead and start us off. Got a lovely girls right there. The Sister Keeper Empowerment Center, also known as the I Define Me Movement, was founded in 2002 by Tracy Berry McGee in St. Louis, Missouri. And the Bryan Station High School Sister Keeper Program was developed in 2019 in collaboration with Bryan Station Middle School, aiming to create a bridge from the eighth to ninth grade. And we have been recognized for building positive character, critical thinking skills, and academic success in young females of color. Our why. Our purpose is for our young ladies to leave us inspired with the mind and spirit to seek their purpose. Our mission is for our young ladies to go on to be self-confident team players able to fight issues that plague our communities. Our goal, that our young ladies leave with an increased confidence and self-awareness. So the structure of Sister Keeper, we have school-based mentoring, monthly sessions, guest speakers from our community, and community service activities. Our school-based mentoring, um, our mentors meet regularly with our small group of mentees. This is a safe place for our mentees um, to share anything they have going on in their personal lives at school or outside of school. And this is a picture of our large group session that we try to have twice a month. And in those large group sessions, we have different topics that include self-esteem, positive affirmations, academic transitions, mental health, self-care, and empowerment. And those are just a few pictures of some of the activities we've done with the young ladies. Our Phenomenal Women Sister Keeper series is where we invite phenomenal women, women from our community to come in and share with our young ladies um, different um, opportunities, different careers, uh, and the young ladies get an up close and personal um, chance to actually talk to these ladies. Um, they actually look like them and are maybe doing things that they inspire to do later on in life. One of my favorite um, phenomenal women speakers was um, Miss Ebony Cooper. She came and we all left uh, inspired both mentally and physically with all of her um, aspirations and things that she taught us um, to get through the days, difficult days. Community service. That's one of my favorite aspects of Sister Keeper. We go out in the community and we just get to give back to the community that is given to us. So some of our annual events are the Valentine's Day event at the nursing home and we go and we make Valentine's Day cards for the nursing home residents and the girls get to hand them to them and they really enjoy that. We go to the Ronald McDonald House to volunteer and then within our feeder patterns we will work different fall festivals at elementary schools and we'll also read at the elementary schools, as well as work the reality store for middle schools, especially Bryan Station Middle, just going and letting the students see the sister keepers and what they can look forward to joining when they come to Bryan Station High School. Our sister keeper pledge, we recite this after every session, and at the beginning of the school year, we actually break down um, the pledge so that ladies aren't just reading words, that they actually are um, embodying the words, um, rep they represent what they say and they understand these and they're able to actually use these, use these things in their everyday lives. So we asked a few of our girls uh, what they liked about being in Sister Keeper and I'll just read a couple. Um, one said that they like help in the middle school. Uh, the other one said that I liked the guidance they gave us during our time figuring out what we were doing post high school um, it gave me a support system with girls who look just like me with the same struggles, and it was um, something that helped me throughout school. And being a sister keeper doesn't just stop once you graduate. We also have a graduate sister keeper group, and we keep up with them, and we meet every 
winter break. So when they're home from break, we all get them together. And most of the time, the schedules align, and we can all have lunch together. And we ask them as well what they liked about being in the graduate sister keeper group. And some of them said they enjoy still having that sisterhood feeling. They like getting to catch up with others. And my favorite is that they also like the continuous support from the adults because we do continue to message them and check in with them and make sure that they're doing well after high school, and most of them are. It's really, really beautiful to see. And overall, our outcomes for our program, um, we want to help build positive characters. We want to help develop and enhance critical thinking skills. We want to help motivate females towards success in school and life. Help guide females towards positive identity development. And we also want to help provide cultural enrichment. And that's what we have for y'all today. Well, thank you for allowing us to present and talk about our program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for what you do for these kids each and every day and for your partnership as well. Dr. Liggins. Okay. Thank you, ladies, very much. Um, next on the superintendent's uh, agenda, I would like to call me Osha Williams to come forward. And um, she would be doing two presentations. The first will be the... Um, update on the request for proposals process, and we're following it to identify our high quality instructional resources to support classroom instruction. And then immediately following that, uh, Dr. Williams, if you will also go into the deeper learning initiative, please. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Good evening, board members, Dr. Liggins, and guests. Um, this first presentation is focused in on where we are with our high quality instructional resources. Um, so before we start any presentation, of course, we want to make sure that we're tying that to our goals and aligning them. So this one is really focused in on our student achievement um, priority and our strategic plan. And specifically looking at that goal of multiple data from interim benchmark assessments to utilize those to determine effectiveness of district curriculum. So when we think about our district improvement plan, we're looking at the four areas of PLC's assessment, accelerated learning, and culture and climate. And then it is also aligning to the following uh, superintendent standards that are up on the screen. When we think about our portrait of a graduate, which is really where the rubber meets the road in ensuring that our students are prepared for the global society, it's really tying to all of these um, competencies that we're expecting to see within our students in Fayette County. So just a quick rundown of the process and the timeline, because this has been a very um, thorough and expanded approach to how we are approaching um, our curriculum resources, specifically for ELA and math. So we have a curriculum resource cycle in our district where typically when we are looking at what we would refer to in the past as curriculum adoption, uh, and I'm going to put some air quotes around that because we really are moving forward in a new way in how we look at those resources because we're not looking necessarily at following a program with fidelity. We're looking at the integrity of a program. So how does that um, program or resource align to the standards that we teach in Kentucky and how does it best teach at the tier one level to help us um, with student learning? So what we started with is an RFP, um, and that was put out for people to bid on. And then we actually received um, 38 bids um, from 22 unique vendors. And so from there, we had our steering committee, which was comprised of several groups of people, and I will show you who uh, was made up of that in just a second. But their primary goal is to make sure that we are keeping the integrity of the process. We want to make sure that we are utilizing the rubrics that are given to us by the state of Kentucky on what are high quality instructional resources and that we are making this process as free of bias as possible. And so their goal was to look at those rubrics and the bids that came in and our goal was to find a robust tier one um, high quality instructional resource for ELA and math, looking at the various grade bands of K2 for reading and writing, 312 for reading and writing, and K12 for math. So that screening committee used those rubrics and they narrowed that down to make sure that they actually bid on what was the minimum requirements for what we were looking for. And that process took us to uh, the beginning of December. 
And so from there, what we did is um, the ones that made the minimum requirements based off of those rubrics moved on to what we call the stakeholder review process. Now, this is where we took a more expanded approach to the review because the stakeholder review process was open to every single person in the district, teachers, students, families, community members. So we posted on the website um, demos for all of the um, ones that made it through, and those were from 10 unique vendors. And they were able to view the demos online, provide feedback. There were also um, some in-person opportunities to look at some of the tangible resources through um, partnerships with our public library friends, as well as holding a vendor fair at the STEAM Academy mid-February. And so now we are in phase three, which is going all the way until the end of April. And this is where the steering committee has looked at all the feedback from that stakeholder review process, and they are then determining, okay, based off of what we know is good practice, best practice um, in terms of resources and the feedback that we got, how are we going to then narrow that down in terms of questions we want to ask for a final vendor presentation? So at the beginning of March, actually the middle of March, um, we held those vendor presentations where we asked them specific questions as it related to a couple of different areas. We asked them about flexibility and adaptability to our unit frameworks. Because again, this is not about doing a program from cover to cover. It's about we've outlined in Fayette County what the essential standards are and what we expect every student to learn and be able to master. And so how is that resource best um, integrating with what our unit frameworks say is essential? The second thing that we were looking for in terms of questions was EL integration as well as how could it support our dual language immersion programs because we want to make sure that every student has access to high quality instructional resources. Third, we were looking at the options. What are the consumables? So in this um, high quality instructional resource uh, adoption, if you will, we really want to make sure that we are not only embracing the digital age, but also understanding what is developmentally appropriate in terms of tangibles and consumables um, that students may need. And also looking, of course, at the funding. We wanna be fiscally responsible and see how they were uh, staying within the budget that we had given them. And then from a K-5 perspective specifically, we wanted to know how was the reading and writing uh, materials aligned to the science of reading, which is the focus for our state. And then of course, professional learning. We wanted to make sure that there was professional learning provided in a gradual release form for teachers over at least a three period, three year period of time. And so we're in phase three and so what happened was the vendor final presentations and then the committee got back together and then some consensus building around what, what would we like to recommend um, to the board by the end of April on where those resources are falling. So that's the current phase that we are in. And so you can stay tuned and look forward to our recommendation at the regular meeting in April. So we talked about the committee members' representation. So there were several groups that were represented here, and we really wanted them to take on the lens of um, their expertise to help us with the feedback. And so again, outside of the steering committee members that you see on the screen, every single member of the community from teacher groups and student groups were able to provide feedback during that phase two stakeholder review process. So this is just giving a little more information on things that I've already kind of touched upon in terms of what specifically happened within each phase. So again, just to highlight, 38 proposals, 22 unique vendors. And th these are the criteria that we were looking at as it related to the instructional resources rubric. We wanted to make sure certainly that it was aligned to Kentucky academic standards, that it was research-based and externally validated, that there were comprehensive text questions and tasks, that it was culturally relevant and free from bias, accessible for all learners, and that there was a sustainability piece to that. So as I mentioned before, phase two was what is before you on the screen. It was broken down into two parts. The first part was looking at those electronic resources in the demos, and the second part was the in-person opportunities to view those tangibles. 
And then as I said, final vendor presentation is part of phase three. And we've talked about what those representative questions were focused around. And so as we look at next steps, what we are looking forward to is that this Friday, we're gonna be able to provide what the recommendation um, that's coming out of the committee was for those resources, and then a final recommendation to the board at the end of April. Any questions? Any questions, board members? Chair Murphy, I just have a statement. Board Green. I just really appreciate um, the holistic approach to really ensuring that you are staying focused on what Kentucky is asking, that these are high quality, you're following all of those, and then also really providing resources for families and, and all stakeholders to see the materials. I heard feedback from families that took their kids to the library and looked at the books uh, and were able to really feel part of the process. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. I look forward to the recommendation. I also want to give a shout out to our multilingual ambassadors. They did a phenomenal job. They were there on site at those on-person opportunities to provide language support to all of our families. And so it was phenomenal to see families be able to access the resources in that way. I just had a question. Thank you again for um, all of the information. Uh, all of this stems from uh, KDE, correct? Yes, ma'am. So could you give us just a little bit of background on that so um, we can match that to what we're doing right now? Yes, absolutely. So what we are going through is our um, curriculum adoption process, and so they're on a cycle. So what you have is, you know, you have um, usually every five years. Sometimes it can go up to seven years where you are re reviewing the resources that you are providing in terms of tier one um, resources for students within a district, and you put them on a cycle. And so we are currently in our ELA and math review of that. We will then, in subsequent years, within the next year and a half, we'll go through the same thing with um, science, and then a couple of years after that, we'll have social studies. And so the focus is not necessarily um, what we may have referred to as basils in the past, in terms of like looking at a particular textbook and saying on day one you're going to teach page 10 and on day two you're going to teach this. It's really about have we looked at what is considered high quality instructional resources and there are rubrics related to that and we look at that and make sure that we are matching what we believe is the best um, fit to the Kentucky standards for students to learn at high levels. I have just one more question. Mm -hmm. um, about the teachers and working with the PLTs in professional development, how would that work? Absolutely, so the reason that we wanna bring this in at the end of April, um, and typically when we look at um, renewal of contracts for curriculum resources, it has typically landed um, mid to end of May. We wanted to do that earlier this year so that we can start um, a contract as soon as May 1. Um, and part of that contract would be to start offering professional learning to teachers so that they can get acclimated, acclimated to those resources s as soon as possible. And then we will continue to offer that through our professional learning summits as well as throughout the school year. But we want to do that as soon as possible. And we'll have um, on-site professional learning opportunities as well as virtual professional learning opportunities. We really want to meet um, the needs of whatever the teachers have so that we feel comfortable with executing that in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Clark. Thank you, Board Member Green. And then that is, you've answered the question I was going to ask, which is um, the alignment of these resources with the professional learning that we're offering and trying to be responsive to the feedback that professional learning needs to be individualized and specific to our educators. So having these tools in hand, I think, is will be helpful uh, and, and ensure that, that we achieve those goals. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. And I guess you're you're staying on on the stage. You for the, got me the again. Um, so I'm also going to um, ask for our director of professional learning, Jesse Matilda, to join me during this presentation. So this presentation is focused in on deeper learning and really our um, intentional focus in moving forward as we think about elevating teacher and student agency. 
So again, our strategic priorities that are here um, on the screen, we're really focused in on student achievement, but also we're going to see some overlap there with unity, belonging, and student efficacy, as well as our culturally responsive workforce. I want to bring us back to um, when I first started my uh, journey here as Assistant Superintendent of Academic Services, and I laid out for um, you all what was going to be our focus for the next three years. And so I just want to bring us back really quickly to make sure that we're all on the same page that last year was about the what. It was the year of the framework. It was about putting the tights in place so that we knew exactly what we valued here in our district. This year, we're focusing more on the how, and we're going to continue that focus in moving into the next school year and focus really intensely on collective efficacy as well as our instructional playbook that talks about how do we do this work in terms of ensuring that every student is learning at high levels. And that's part of that full implementation. So what is it that we're looking for in our classrooms? We're looking at a high level in terms of focus instruction, high levels of cognitive engagement, and consistent monitoring of student progress. So this is really important because as we started on this journey of what is the how, how can we encompass the how, what's going to be our guiding question, I landed on this. What did you do today to make learning or school irresistible to kids? And it's really about that. We want to have students that come home from school and you ask them, what did you learn today? And they cannot wait to tell you the things that they've done. No longer do we want to hear about, I don't know, nothing. It wasn't anything that I haven't learned before. We really want it to be irresistible. And so in order for us to do that, we really had to think about an emergent leadership approach. And so that is where deeper learning comes in. I want to be the first to say, sometimes when you say deeper learning, because, you know, there are lots of words that we use in education that become buzzwords and initiatives that happen that one time with that one person. But this is really about the work. This is what we do. It is nothing new. It is about hunkering down and focusing in on what we're doing. So deeper learning is learning that matters to all kids. It's about having some meaningful and challenging experience so that students can actually apply what they're learning to authentic context. We have to also let go of this notion of when students get into the real world. Students are in the real world now. The real world is all around us. And so we want to make sure that we're able to provide instruction and learning experiences that are vibrant and that are authentic for students to engage in learning at high levels. It's about students able to ask those questions and reflect on what they're doing and tell you how what they've learned has impacted them and how it's impacting the world. And it's about content expertise, right? We're not lowering the bar in saying, learn whatever you want, right? It's still about those standards and the frameworks that we've put in place, but now this is the work and how we execute it. So when we think about this in deeper learning, really it comes down to a few competencies, which are there in the color boxes. It's about self-directed learning, collaboration, academic mindset, content expertise, critical thinking and problem solving, effective communication. There is nothing new there that we have not experienced before in education, but it's about the intentionality. And so underneath there, it just gives some examples and some thoughts on how that might look um, when we really focus in on deeper learning uh, competencies. And so as we started to go through this process, we had the opportunity to partner with Harvard um, through Deeper Learning Dozen. So we were one of 12 districts that were selected to do this work and so that we can start looking at the research behind it and how do we really substantiate this. And so we started looking into what was called deliverology. And so I want to share some of those concepts with you because it really helps us to think about how we came with came up with our three-legged stool and really what we're about when we talk about deeper learning in our district. So for deliverology, it really rests on four kind of questions. The first one is, what are we trying to do? The second one is, 
how are we trying to do it? The third is, how will we know if we are on track? And the fourth question is, what will we do if we're not on track? So talking about course correction. And so as we thought about those questions, we came up with our three-legged stool. What are we trying to do? Well, in Fayette County, we're trying to make sure that we have vibrant learning and authentic assessment opportunities for all students. We want to make sure that there is authentic and true family and community collaboration, and that includes post-secondary as well as industry. And thirdly, talking about transformational connections. That means, how are we looking at our policies, procedures, our attention to adult learning, to really foster those connections across the board as it relates to deeper learning? So it's not just about student learning, it's about all of us learning and having that symmetry with what we're learning. But we also know that when we're talking about what we will call teacher goji, you can't do this and have anything be permanent practice until it is deeply understood completely. And so that also requires a phased approach. So it's about making sure that educators have their own agency, that they feel respected and satisfied in their work, and that we're using the vehicle of a professional community to accomplish that. So this is where we started. We started with 38. And so you will hear us talk about the campaign from 38 to 3,800. And really all that is, is our phased approach to ensuring that deeper learning is permeating every part of the district, starting with our teachers. So we started with a cohort of 38. Our next phase in the work is 380. So we're looking for 342 more uh, first responders to help us in this work. And ultimately, we want to be at 3,800. And so on the screen, you'll see our external partners. I mentioned Harvard before. We also have partners with CKEC, which is our regional collaborative with the Kentucky Department of Education. We have it with What School Could Be, Ted Dentersmith, KC7, which is um, an industry partner with cybersecurity, and STEPS, which stands for Classroom Teachers Enacting Positive Change. And it's all about teacher leadership. And we needed to have these partners at the table because if we're not all on the same page on where we're going, it's gonna feel really disjointed. And so that's where we've started the work. And the way that we've chosen to approach this work with our first 38 that we will expand on is the design thinking process. And that really is about emergent leadership and thinking about problems of practice and action research and things that we wanna solve. And so that's where we started. So second semester, we were looking at understanding just what is design thinking? We started exploring it this school year, and now we really want to materialize that and get some steam with our 380. And so I talked a little bit about symmetry of learning before, and really what that means is this. We can't expect our students to experience deeper learning if our teachers have never experienced deeper learning. And so we have to provide that parallel or that symmetry so that adults also have those experiences so that then they know how to adapt those for students. And so I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples of how we've started that work. And of course, we have a long way to go, but we're really excited about our start. So with leadership in our district leadership meeting, we had some of our 38 deeper learning uh, early starters with this work come and present to principals and take them through a deeper learning activity of developing a purpose map. And through that purpose map, we were able to take them through the various competencies of deeper learning that we talked about before. With students, uh, earlier this month, we had the opportunity to have some of our students come and uh, do a real live uh, student-led brunch they developed the menu, they were talking to us about how they um, learned their skills, what they want to do with those skills as they move forward. And so again, that's deeper learning. It's about students being able to show their content expertise, to effectively communicate that, to self-direct in some uh, uh, aspects of developing the menu and how they wanted to present. And then with our staff, um, in our most recent common unit assessment, we had an on-demand writing piece, and it was really important for us to have a district-wide approach to how we were calibrating um, what we expected to see within writing across the district. 
that was a deeper learning experience because it allowed um, educators who may not have been able to get together and look at writing something that was in their content expertise and just have those discussions and discourse about how are we ensuring that we are looking at writing in the same way across the district. So again, I'll go back to Teacher Goji because Mr. Matilla is going to come and he's going to talk to us a little bit about what our professional learning looks like for this summer and the things that we can expect. And it goes back to this concept of being able to understand deeply and completely and to provide that sense of agency and symmetry within adult learning experiences. Good evening, board, uh, Dr. Liggins. I'm excited to share a little about the summer professional learning. Um, the professional learning truly embodies our professional learning shifts we've established as a district. Our overarching shift in paradigm from event to an ongoing process and then our enduring shifts uh, truly ensuring learning is engaging, relevant and impactful. Uh, we also sought input and uh, identified innovation opportunities for our professional learning experiences. Uh, we used the 2023-24 Impact Kentucky uh, Working Conditions Survey, uh, which will help us, which helped us identify district-wide trends uh, to guide our overall areas for focus. We also uh, asked for principal needs and interests. Uh, with the idea of informing our administrator professional learning conference uh, programming. Additionally, we've asked for staff needs and interest, uh, which will again inform the programming for the FCPS Professional Learning Summit. Uh, the 2023-24 Impact Kentucky Working Conditions Survey established three focus areas that we thought we could build upon, being professional learning, feedback, and resources and tools. As we continue with this work, we would expect an evolution of the shifts, creating the conditions for transformational professional learning. The idea that the design of the learning experiences is based on learning needs uh, and is uh, activated by a facilitator uh, with the ultimate goal of empowering all of our learners. This shifts us away from transactional professional learning, where the emphasis, uh, or basically an expert, transmits knowledge to learners in a somewhat compliance format. The immediate shifts we should come to expect for professional learning for the upcoming year will be a shift from presenter to facilitator, an emphasis on collective efficacy and agency, uh, inclusion of teacher and staff facilitators and, and associated exemplars. Uh, we want to provide strategies and tools that can be applied immediately. Uh, we also want participants to establish action steps so that they can apply their learning to their daily roles. And ultimately, we want to expand opportunities for collaboration and choice. All this culminates to that vibrant learning refer referenced by Dr. Williams, uh, where we have strong learning, deeper learning for adults that ultimately leads to stronger, deeper learning for our students. Our CDIP focus areas include PLCs uh, with a intentional fo focus on backward design and exemplars. Focus area two is assessment Specifically, we will focus on formative assessment. Focus area three is accelerated learning, where we will focus on the FCPS coaching structure. Focus area four is culture and climate, where we will focus on the FCPS leadership definition and framework for all role groups. We also have our professional learning hubs and dates uh, pulled together. There are 19 hubs all of which will utilize uh, internal FCPS infrastructure. Uh, you'll also notice all the professional learning opportunities from June through August 8th. Additionally, you'll notice a shift to very role-specific uh, organization. You'll see intervention, world language, EL, uh, fine arts, to name a few. Uh, and you'll also um, see that offerings moving forward will include 
uh, grade level specific professional learning opportunities, uh, subject specific professional learning opportunities with choice. Finally, uh, we're in, currently in phase one where we're continuing our planning and preparation, uh, which is an intricate process. Uh, we're also entering, beginning to enter, uh, phase two, which is establishing our current state through reflection, but also the development of school-based professional learning plans. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, to both of you for the overview. Any questions, board members? Do you mind to speak um, to uh, either one of you to the extent to which um, the plan for deeper learning this summer reflects lessons learned, feedback collected from uh, last year? Because uh, I, kn I know that we are, we try to have a continuous improvement mindset. I think there were great successes uh, to what we saw last year. And then we also had feedback for some, some opportunities for improvement. So to what extent did you capture the things that worked and then perhaps make some adjustment in response to that feedback and reflection? So I'll, I'll speak to the uh, reflection immediately following. Uh, we had an immediate survey that went out. We also had uh, feedback from multiple role groups. What we heard loud and clear was that we uh, overall enjoyed the role-specific professional learning and that opportunity for, for choice. There was also a desire to have continued opportunities for networking um, and planning and working with peers in, in that uh, active networking across schools. Mm -hmm. So that is de uh, a, a definite piece of the work across all hubs. Um, we also heard uh, the desire to get ex uh, professional learning that was extremely aligned to what I do every single day uh, and also that had strategies and tools that could be applied immediately. So those are expectations within our proposal format. Um, I will also say that we've addressed um, the uh, learning, the survey, 23-24 uh, survey, uh, in, in aspects for growth, but also in areas of strength. So the networking was an example of something that we have received very positive feedback round, but that we want to expand upon. And then with feedback, we want to ensure uh, that feedback we're getting from all role groups is utilized and that we are responsive uh, in developing our professional learning moving forward. My attitude to that would be always thinking about the logistics feedback mm -hmm. that came from that, which is how we came to expand the hub so that we could keep things internal um, and have that familiarity and um, ensure that things ran smoothly in that way. So that's why you see um, some of those learning experiences starting as soon as July to ensure that we could keep um, the role groups um, intact, but also maintain the integrity of um, the learning goals. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you both. Anything else, board members? Board Member Clark? Yes, I do have one question. Um, and it's about the deeper learn, learning um, standards that you have here. Uh, one of them is inquiry-based learning. I'm very curious about that. I've heard a lot about it. And I don't know if you can explain it in a short period of time. but Well, it's really just the basis of how are we looking at, um, looking at questions and finding the answers to those questions is how I would oversimplify it. Thank you. Chair Murphy. Um, I have two comments. I'm going to start with professional learning and then work my way back. Um, I really appreciate, so teaching adults is different than teaching children. There's science behind that. And I recognize the shift of your methodology with the professional learning, having the, the instructor or the leader be the facilitator instead of the give and get situation, acknowledging the prior experience and the exemplars in the room and bringing that prior knowledge into building new knowledge. And then also where you highlighted that the idea of making ensuring that we're giving tools and resources so there can be immediate impact in the learning. So I just wanted to give a moment to recognize that you're aligning that with the science of adult learning, and I appreciate that. 
Um, the other one is back in the very beginning, we talked about what deeper learning looks like in the classroom, and I've been very blessed to have the time and the opportunity with the Chiefs to visit all of our campuses um, at some point in the past two years. And I have seen the focused instruction, the high levels of cognitive engagement, and the consistent monitoring in every building in different classrooms, whether in every building you can see the learning, um, what's it called? The, the learning, learning intentions. intentions. Uh -huh. And learning intentions are right there, what they're going to cover for that week. They can go home and tell their kids. The teachers ask them to repeat this. Um, so it is there, the um, high-level academic vocabulary, the rigor of that. You hear that when you're in the halls. You hear it in the classroom. The teachers are using it, expecting the students to respond with that same high level of um, language, which is very exciting from elementary to high school. It's, you can see that. And then also, I'll, I'll just share three examples. In one classroom, the teacher was leading a discussion, but with, only with questions, which I think kind of gets to that inquiry-based questioning. She asked a question, then the student responded, then she asked another question. And then, as it went on, she encouraged the students to ask more questions and just engage the entire room. Everybody was involved. It felt like authentic learning. Um, another one where the students had to choose topics and then debate and kind of whether or not they, that was their personal belief, but they had to build that knowledge behind the scenes and then come to class, share that, and then be able to justify it. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that I've seen it firsthand and I really appreciate what our teachers are doing every day. And in every single building, our students are, have access to this. So thank you, and I'm excited to see it to continue to grow. So to the educators in the classroom, I see your hard work every day and I really appreciate you on what you're doing, so thank you. Thank you, Board Member Green. And I th also think the whole presentation on deeper learning, I would encourage everyone to uh, pay close attention because it speaks to our focus on outcomes, not just output. And, and so much of the rhetoric around education focuses on, you, you know, measurable things like test scores. When there's so much more than that, you know, people who have heard me talk before have heard me make this reference, but today's kindergartners will reach retirement age, at least what we consider retirement age today, uh, in the year 2083, which is the same distance from today as 1965 <laughs> is to today. And so think about how much change happened in the world between 1965 and now. So we're preparing our kids to succeed in a future that we sitting in this room can't possibly imagine. But these skills that we're talking about through things like inquiry and deeper learning, those are going to endure no matter what technological advances emerge. And th those truly are things that can't be measured in any standardized way, uh, but the impact is significant and huge and meaningful. So uh, we appreciate this work. We appreciate what our educators are doing uh, to prepare our students to excel, not just in the here and now, but for whatever whatever future that awaits them, whatever that those 2080s look like. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mia, Shen, Jesse, <coughs> and board members. Uh, next is our monthly update from Dr. Soraya Matthews for Unity, Belonging, and Student Efficacy. Um, this evening, I am sharing the March update uh, report for unity, belonging, and student efficacy. Of course, anchoring our work to our strategic priorities, uh, and as you know, uh, strategic priority number two is unity, belonging, and student efficacy, where our mission is to foster and instill a culture of unity, belonging, and student efficacy across our entire district. By the numbers, some information to share, um, some points of celebration for the Unity Belonging and Student Efficacy Office. You have remember, you may remember me sharing that we were awarded a Stronger Connections grant from the Kentucky Department of Education. We have launched 17 Stronger Connections programs in 17 of our, of our elementary schools, which is touching over 300 third graders, where we are working on creating a sense of belongingness making stronger connections to their school and building reading resilience in these third graders. So we have 
Uh, the program is offered for six weeks, two days a week for two hours per day, and we have 37 school level connectors who are leading the program in our schools. Also continuing our celebration for Women's History Month, uh, some fast facts as it relates to Fayette County Public Schools. We have 49% of our student population is female. 73% of our employees are female. 78% of our teachers are female and 60% of our administrators are female. We also would like to highlight and celebrate that we have 11 schools throughout our district uh, who are named for prominent women um, in history, either for the Lexington community or at large. And further, a tribute to women in FCPS. I have with me some special guests that I will be introducing shortly and sharing a little bit about them and celebrating their service to Fayette County Public Schools, specifically as it relates to their concurrent service to Fayette County Public Schools. And just to explain what that means is, uh, we definitely have to, uh, staff in our district who leave and come back, um, and we appreciate that. Actually, I'm one of those employees myself. Uh, but these ladies that I'm going to highlight this evening are celebrated for their concurrent service to Fayette County Public Schools, so no break in service. And the first person that I would like to um, celebrate and recognize is Ms. Barbara Williams. Will you please stand? Ms. Barbara Williams is currently an administrative support personnel in the, in the JDP uh, administration building with 39 years of experience in our district concurrent service. The average years of experience for our uh, administrative support is 11 years. Ms. Barbara began as administrative assistant at Dixie Elementary in 1984 with Principal Linda Keller. At Dixie, Ms. Williams served alongside several principals including Amy McVeigh and Larray Jones. When Barbara accepted the promotion to work at the district central, central office, she was hired by Mr. Mike Kennedy. She has continued to provide excellent administrative support under the leadership of Mary Beth Gaines, Jenny Dyer, Frank Coffey, and now Ms. Shamia Ford. Ms. Williams is a warm smile and a genuine asset to this entire building. And I want to say thank you to Ms. Barbara Williams for your service. Shamia Ford, please come forward. Shamia will be presenting Ms. Barbara with her flowers. Ms. Robin Barker, will you please stand? Ms. Robin Barker is a teacher, a itinerant band teacher for Fayette County Public Schools with concurrent service of 39 years of service for Fayette County. The current position, average years of service is 8.3 years. Ms. Robin is a teacher at, she began as a teacher at the Bluegrass School providing music therapy to students with disability. Soon after, Ms. Barker became an itinerant band teacher. She has taught in more than 21 schools and have worked with at least 25 principals. In her 35, 39 years of service, she has worked at eight years with Jesse Clark Middle School students and 21 years with SCAPA. Ms. Barker is also proud to share that both her daughter and sons are educators within Fayette County Public Schools as well. Ms. Robin Barker, thank you for your service. <laughs> Beth Randolph. Beth Randolph, will you please come forward? Beth will be presenting Robin with her flowers. Our next honoree, Ms. Becky Brown, will you please stand?
Ms. Brown works in our child nutrition department at Arlington Elementary and currently holds 38 years of concurrent service within Fayette County Public Schools. The position of child nutrition specialist, years of service averages eight years. Ms. Brown is a proud Henry Clay High School graduate. She began working in child nutrition in 1986 at her alma mater, Henry Clay, where she served meals for students and staff for 10 years. She then transitioned to Arlington Elementary where she currently serves as present. Ms. Brown knows each student by name there. When I asked Ms. Brown why the food smelled so good when I was there the other day, she responded because it is made and served with love. I've told her, I've been told that Arlington has the best green beans in town, just FYI. <laughs> Mrs. Brown's son is a coach and educator at Woodford County University in her, in Woodford County, I'm sorry, and her grandson plays fo football at the collegiate level. Thank you, Ms. Becky Brown, for your service. Principal Lizette Rogers will be presenting her her flowers. Our next honoree for concurrent service, currently administrator, Ms. Beth Randolph, please stand. Beth has served Fayette County Public Schools for 36 years. She would be, uh, she would probably impress upon me to also add that she spent 2.5 years tutoring before she officially joined as a teacher, therefore 38.5 years at Fayette County, serving Fayette County Public Schools. Beth began her career at FCPS as a teacher at Harrison Elementary. Beth is a proud graduate of Henry Clay High School, having also attended Takes Creek Elementary, Takes Creek Junior High, and Morton Junior High School. Beth taught school, taught class in the classroom for 23 years, 22 of those years at SCAPA, before transitioning into the principal role, which she has served for 14 years. And actually, Beth, again, I mentioned that she has a 2.5 years of tutoring, but her family has been, um, her immediate family has worked within Fayette County Public Schools since 1964, with both her parents being educators and her dad serving as an administrator. I want to say, Beth Randolph, thank you for your service. Tracy Bruno will be presenting you your flowers. Our next honoree, uh, another phenomenal woman, Ms. Rhonda Lewis. Ms. Rhonda Lewis is a paraeducator who began at Takes Creek High School. Then she went on to work at LTMS and Lafayette where she served students in the MASH unit for 10 years. She now works as a paraeducator with Principal Bill at Beaumont Middle School. Ms. Lewis considers Beaumont her home and has served the students and families there for almost 20 years and counting. Ms. Lewis hoped to have been here today but had other family obligations, but we thank Ms. Rhonda Lewis for her service. Our next honoree, Ms. Sharon Wesley Porter, would you please stand? <laughs> Sharon has been in our district for 33 years, now serving as counselor at Henry Clay High School. In the beginning, Sharon was majoring in law school when she first started working as a long-term sub um, and was later called to be a teacher for business, marketing, and technology in 1990 at Bryan Station High School with Principal Donna George. Ms. Porter served as a teacher for 15 years at both Bryan Station High School and Henry Clay High School. From 2005 to the present, Sharon has served as counselor at Henry Clay High School. 
While at Henry Clay, Sharon has worked alongside seven principals, with the most recent being Mr. Paul Little and Dr. Corey Franklin. Ms. Sharon Wesley Park Porter, thank you for your service. <laughs> Dr. Corey Franklin will present you with your flowers. Last but certainly not least, for concurrent service recognition, we are recognizing Ms. Sharon Guest, who works in our transportation department. Ms. Sharon joined the FCPS family in 1991 under Superintendent Moreland and Bill Fain as transportation manager. Ms. Guest began her career as a bus monitor for four years before transitioning into the bus driver's seat. Ms. Guest has driven at all grade levels, elementary, middle, and high school, but her favorite bus assignments is working with students with special needs. She, loved that she, she loves that she is the first face our students see on their way to school and the last when they arrive home. Ms. Guest has driven more than 650,000 miles in the Lexington community roads in Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> Ms. Sharon Guest, thank you for your service. Kim Webb, Director of Transportation, will give her your flowers. Thank you for allowing me to share the story of these phenomenal women. Thank you. And let's do a picture with all of them and let's give them a round of applause <laughs> and thank them for all of their kind work. <laughs> if, if you all could join us on the dais. Thank you, Dr. Matthews and board team. Next, under the superintendent's report, I would like to ask the chief operating officer, Myron Thompson, to present the monthly <laughs> construction report. I appreciate that support, Dr. Barber. So I, I don't take it personal when everyone gets up and leaves. So, 
Thank you, Board and Dr. Liggins. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you our uh, major capital construction projects uh, update this month. Starting with Mary Britton Middle School, uh, there's a rendering of the facility for our viewing public. Progress is moving along quite nicely. We're at 54% completion. Here's an overview of our construction partners and budget. And information about this particular project can be found at fcps.net forward slash MS construction. Looking at the uh, completed work thus far, all of our walls are complete. Our canopy foundations and topping slab at the stage is completed. Uh, we've had our topping slab in area D at 70%. We've continued uh, with prep in area C. We've had some uh, CMU work taking place in area D and area E corridor, uh, starting with our steel construction uh, in area D and area B is at 90%. We've had blocking for our roofing taking place, bolting that down, continuing with our wall, in wall blocking for areas A and C, and we've also continued framing at the platform elevation in areas A and C. Uh, we've started our sprinkler work, as well as our mechanical, electrical, and plumbing rough ends uh, through, throughout the facility, and our electrical switch gear has been set as well. As we look for upcoming work, uh, our topping and slab work will continue in area C. We will start dock concrete, uh, completing our roof, roofing and structural steel in areas B and D and complete our, our roof in area C. Uh, we will have our uh, continuing our block fill and caulking in area C and A, uh, some drywall work taking place in the gym as well as painting and we will continue with our sprinkler installation in area C up the second floor and continuing our cleanup uh, of the work site. So uh, a few renderings or a few pictures of the, the uh, work effort here, uh, looking at our curtain wall support still in uh, the uh, area A area. Transitioning to area B, a uh, view of the roof still above the second floor corridor. Here's a view of area B, the Family Resource Center, and our still, uh, still work uh, taking place there. A view of the main entry, uh, still work with roof supports. view of the area C, uh, area C mezzanine uh, with the concrete slab pour and prep taking place. And some of that uh, slab pour in the flex spaces there on the second floor in area D. And this is a view from the media center and the roof still taking place. And if you've been by Polo Club, it really is prominent there uh, on site. So. Uh, here's the area E, a cafeteria metal box out uh, in the windows taking place. So we're very uh, happy with our contractor. Transitioning to the hill, uh, here's a rendering of that particular location on Midland. Here's an overview of our construction partners and budget, and we are 71% completion, 71% complete. And information about this particular project can be found at fcps.net forward slash CTE construction. Our completed work with our CMU walls on all floors uh, have continued. Uh, we've had our ceilings continue on levels four and three. We've had our metal stud work and drywall work uh, continuing on all levels of the project. We've had our window glazing continue, continuing on all levels as well. We've had our electrical devices and lighting control uh, continue on levels four and three. And plumbing and above ceiling work uh, continuing on all floors as well. Uh, looking ahead, our CMU work should be near completion. Uh, our ceilings are continued, uh, will continue on levels four and three. Uh, curtain wall work and window glazing will continue as well. We have our duct installation uh, continuing and our electrical and plumbing wall rough ends will continue along with our masonry and electrical devices being installed. And at the beginning of this month, uh, I think our geothermal has concluded, so I know the neighbors are very pleased about that uh, so having, because it is a noisy part of the project and we appreciate their patience as we work through that. So that has wrapped up this month. So. Uh, here are a few views of that particular project, uh, looking at that uh, curtain wall framing and glazing going in. Another view, uh, very uh, changing the very facade of the building. I think it gives a very nice look uh, there on Midland in the downtown corridor. Metal mesh railings going in place. Here we have our culinary arts low masonry walls uh, being installed. View of their metal framing and uni strut at the multipurpose for HVAC and other work taking place there. And a view of a porcelain tile in the mother's room uh, going in. And another view of some metal stud framing at level two. Here we have some accent uh, ceiling paint taking place, a little bit of color and light. And that concludes my report.
for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Any questions, board members? I will say I appreciate how proactive uh, you and your team were, particularly with the neighbors at the Hill. And I think that's what, um, you know, I think everything went smoothly. Obviously, as you said, the geothermal drilling can be disruptive, but uh, their communication was clear and open. And I started early with that, yes. the neighborhood and the community and, and all the feedback I got was that they were very appreciative. So we thank right. you for that. Well, we thank you and the community for your support of our facilities. So right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Myron and board team. That concludes the superintendent's report. At this time, I turn the agenda back over to you, Chairman Murphy. Thank you, Superintendent Liggins. Next on our agenda is a time for remarks by citizens on matters that are on the agenda. Fake County Board of Education Policy 01.45 states members of the public may address the board during the period set aside by the board without submitting an item for the agenda. No action shall be taken during this portion of the meeting on issues raised by the employees of the public unless deemed an emergency. Speakers will not be allowed to make any disparaging or critical remarks by individuals or employees of the district. Such comments or complaints are processed to the district's complaint procedures. There are two opportunities for the public to address the board. Now, at the beginning of the meeting, those members of the public who have signed up prior to the meeting are invited to speak on items that are on the agenda. This is not intended to be a time for debate. However, the board will take the public's input into consideration when making final decisions this evening. Uh, each speaker this evening, uh, we have 15 speakers signed up for items that are on the agenda. So each speaker will receive two minutes for 30 minutes total per our governance policies on items that are on the agenda. Uh, at the end of the meeting, members of the public who have signed up prior to the meeting are invited to address the board on any topic of district-related concern that is not on the agenda. We do have one individual who has signed up for such a topic. So this time, members of the public who have signed up prior to the meeting to address matters on the agenda are invited to speak. We ask that you come to the podium and uh, give your remarks. As I said, we have 15 people who have signed up to speak regarding topics on the agenda, and I will ask each of them to keep their remarks to two minutes or less. And our first speaker this evening, and the time will be on the screen behind us. The first speaker this evening is April Stanley. I would like to yield my time to Jeremy Porter. Thank you very much. Um, Jeremy Porter, you will have four minutes. Board members, superintendent, my daughter's a fifth grade scholar at Rise STEM Academy for Girls. This is her story. Please stand for rise. When she was five years old and readying to enter kindergarten, her preschool teacher told us something we already knew. She said our daughter was very imaginative, skilled at creative problem solving, and relationally and emotionally intelligent. Our, da our daughter wasn't the most academically apt, but no matter, we were supporting her in that while also nurturing those inherent qualities we had seen in her from a very young age. Yet her preschool teacher had an omen for us. Don't let her elementary education squeeze those beautiful qualities out of her. We chose RISE two years ago because we heard about the nurturing environment for girls created there by teachers, staff, and families. We chose RISE because of the opportunity for project-based learning that could, that could more gently support her unique learning styles and skills. RISE has delivered on both of those areas for her. Additionally, her confidence and ability to work collaboratively have been reinforced there. She recently co-led her parent-teacher conference, conference with us, talking about where she has improved and highlighting her own growth areas, including steps she'll be taking to focus on those. Have her math and English math test scores improved while at RISE? Yes. Are they still on the lower end of most of her peers? Yes. Yet my daughter is, to quote Dr. Liggins, more than a test score. The district's 11th hour decision to suspend the sixth grade expansion sent a tectonic shockwave through me as a father. Left with only seven days to research, apply for, and choose from the district's other special programs for my daughter, 
I was frustrated at the district's lack of communication and leadership in this regard. Following Dr. Ligon's announcement, I reached out to each board member, many district level staff, and Director Jacobs to learn more about the reasons for the decision and to share my concerns. Director Jacobs responded immediately and offered her support, for which I was grateful. Over the next 10 days, I tried individual and group emails to every board member, other staff, and phone calls, repeated phone calls with messages left. I found it hard to believe that no one responded. So I am here now to share that my desire is to see my daughter continue to be nurtured at RISE through the end of her eighth grade year, to be given the opportunity to participate in the formation of RISE as a world-class program, for her to show all the ways that she is more than, quote, mediocre, as some have said. Short of that, the RISE community needs the following. Evidence laying out detailed rationale behind the decision to suspend the sixth grade program. A list of all alternatives exhausted before coming to this decision. The plan for how the following will be reinvested this fiscal year into the RISE K-5 through program. The $2.2 million that was originally intended for sixth grade expansion on Main Street. The over 300,000 that was allocated for sixth grade expansion for the grade level expansion and accountability for the district's communication and leadership failures, including publishing a post-mortem review of lessons learned, including leadership failures and successes and planning failures and successes. Thank you, and I yield my time to the next RISE speaker. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Our next speaker this evening is Eric Chell Chellegren. My name is Eric Chilgren. I, I am a freshman at Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. I would like to hear the board's comments and updates on the three-phase $550 million school renovation and construction plan that was released in June 2023. I yield my time to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Our next speaker this evening is uh, Renata, Renata Didart. Am I saying that correctly? Thank you. I want to yield my time to Stephanie Didart. Okay. Uh, we have one more ahead of Stephanie on the list. So our next speaker before Stephanie uh, on this list is Matthew Veed. Mr. Veed. Good evening. Long time no see. Um, so I left a SBDM meeting this afternoon at Cassidy where lots of people were frustrated that the art program at Cassidy was getting cut next year. So at Cassidy, there are this year there are six specials rotations, STEM, gym, library, Spanish, music, and art. And it's hard, to, it's hard to choose any of those to cut from an elementary school. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have an opinion on that, but what, which one of those would you choose to cut from an elementary school? None of them are good choices. Um, but what do you see when you walk into an elementary school on the walls? Art, just art by the students art that they created at their, in their time at school. So a lot of people were upset by that. Um, my dog in the fight is that, I, know I, have, well, I, have t I have two literal dogs in that fight. I have a fourth grader and a second grader. But my dog in the fight is, why is a school district as wealthy as this school district is? How big is the budget? $850 million. $850 million, and, uh, and Miss Hill at Cassidy has to choose to cut a specials program as important as art. And, it, and I don't mean to get sideways with a lot of people in this room, didn't know that there would be this many people here with, with Rise, but there are, there are 37 special programs at the, in the school district. 
And a lot of them would qualify as a functional charter school. Special access, limited access, uses public money. But, and they are, they are funneling funds away from neighborhood schools in a way that makes us have to choose to cut art from an elementary Our, our next speaker this evening is Stephanie Dittert. Uh, you will have four minutes. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Dittert, and I was a proud graduate of Fayette County Public Schools. I attended for 13 years. And when I was in high school, I received both free lunch and the Commonwealth Diploma. So I know firsthand how public education can change a child's life and opportunities. And I commend everyone in this room for their efforts to imp improve public education in Lexington. That being said, I feel deeply disappointed in my experiences as a parent with this school board and particularly this district administration. My daughter attended Rise STEM Academy for Girls for its first three years. And I served on the PTA board for all three of those years. Even during the global pandemic that you love to use as an excuse, we built a community of families that were eager to help provide these girls with opportunities that I would have loved as a child. We were passionate about educational equity. We had big dreams and a big vision, and that was still tiny compared to that of Director Jacobs and the team that she built. What an amazing opportunity that we were going to create together for our children. But slowly, over those three years, it became very clear to us that our vision was no longer shared at the district level. We had to come here month after month to beg you, not for the shiny new building that we were promised, not for extra opportunities, but for enough girls' bathrooms in an all-girls school, for a playground that wasn't built for four-year-olds, for a gym that was larger than a classroom. We had to come here to argue for parity for our elementary school and for our children, not for extra opportunities. We, as a parent, had to inform this body of what was happening at our school, because no one here seemed to know. And we begged you for a plan. We begged you for timely and effective communication. So we could see a year ago, two years ago, that this school was not your priority. That's what your actions have consistently said. And that was well before the mess you've made of the past month. We were never given the resources or the district support to turn our vision into a reality. No wonder RISE isn't showing the progress that you wanted. My personal view is that this is going to become even more difficult without Director Jacobs. You would be hard pressed to find another educator with her vision, her passion, who cares more about our girls and who puts more into this job. So thank you so much, Director Jacobs and everyone on the RISE team for your hard work and making the best of the scraps that you've been given. It has never been unnoticed by our families. So as a parent, I see that. Okay, you don't value RISE? Fine, I'll move my daughter to SCAPA. Consistently ranked one of the top performing schools in the state. Surely these kids are your priority, right? Hmm, I guess not, because her first week of school, I got an email urging me to come here and advocate for a gym that wasn't also the cafeteria, for a performing arts space that they, the performing arts students could actually use. So I ask myself, where's that nickel? What is it that you're prioritizing? Which students are you prioritizing? Because from my point of view, it doesn't seem like any of them. I lack faith in your transparency. I lack faith in your ability to communicate effectively and openly with families. And my daughter, all of our children, deserve better from you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ditter. Our next speaker this evening is April Wheeler Brown. Ms. Brown, Wheeler Brown, you will have uh, two minutes. I'd like to yield my time to Stan Weddle. Thank you. Our next speaker, I'm sorry, who did you say? I didn't know her, but Jamie Hurt. Jamie Hurt, okay, okay. You are later on the list, so I'll make a note of that. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Monica Mundy.
would like to allow Monica Hawk to use my time. Thank you. Good evening, dear members of the school board council. Uh, she would be taking the two minutes. You've not signed up, Ms. Hawk, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, just so two minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm a new parent to rise this year with a second grade student, and I felt compelled to be here today. And I stand before you today not only as a concerned parent, but as a voice for safety and well-being for our children at Rye STEM Academy with a sense of urgency to bring forth pressing issues that require your immediate attention. First and foremost, let's address the glaring health and safety concerns plaguing the school grounds. While waiting in the car line to pick up my daughter, I noted on several days raccoons roaming the playground. Raccoons in the US are known to carry infectious diseases that can be transmitted to humans through their bodily secretions or feces that can cause rabies, Bailiscaris braconis, giridosis, leptospirosis, as well as other bacterial diseases such as Salmonella and E. coli, fungi and rare parasites that poses a risk for illness in all humans. I recommend that you contact the Department of Health to make sure the grounds are safe for everyone, teachers and students alike. If you've ever had the distinguished pleasure of placing foot on the school grounds, there are a multitude of shipping containers that puzzles me on a daily basis at drop off and pick up as well as electrical equipment. As we all know, electrical emissions have implicated, have been implicated in long-term health adverse sequelae, including cancer. Our children deserve a safe and nurturing environment in which to learn and grow. I am thankful that this is a public meeting and the council can be informed of these legitimate health concerns and FCPS leadership is accountable for ensuring the safety of our schools. Of note, the current sitting US Senator of Kentucky came to a RISE PTA meeting early in the school year and took the time to listen, hear, and talk to us parents. His follow through response was that he discussed it with the superintendent of the school board who would then follow through with us. And I'm still waiting for that response. There have been many parents who've submitted multiple open records access requests and those have repeatedly been failed to, to be fulfilled. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Sure. I don't get any of the time that the other people uh, yielded for other speakers. Any chance? I, unless, a, unless another speaker yields, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, well, thanks so much. I had a lot of uh, Thank more. you. Our next speaker on the list is uh, Ariella Washington. It's really convenient that on March 8th, you highlighted Women's History Month and just three days prior notified the Rise family that you will be discontinuing the only program in Fayette County Public Schools geared towards empowering young women. I've been here since the beginning in 2020 when we were promised three years. Since 2020, Rise has become a real community who loves and supports not only our scholars, but their families. Since 2020, FCPS has continued to disappoint and gaslight our family from promising us a new school, a new building, a new location. FCPS has come up with many excuses and zero solutions. FCPS has shown our girls what the world already believes, that women and women of color do not matter. My daughter is currently in third grade and has struggled with reading since the first grade. However, due to the dedication and commitment of our staff, she is now reading on grade level. How many principals do you know that takes the time to get to know each scholar by name, but also know their families and personal situations as well? Unfortunately, due to the lack of support from our district, our director is one more thing that has been taken away from us and will be resigning after the end of the school year. I've worked at a Fayette County Elementary School 
where MTSS staff has purposefully avoided pulling their groups, therefore neglecting the importance of helping the students be the best. This would never happen at RISE. FCPS continues to say they want, to Im they want input from the families of RISE, but yet we are the last to know of any decisions that will affect RISE. You all don't care. You all don't care. You have showed us this time and time again, but you all need to be the ones to look every one of our girls in their eyes and tell them what you've shown them all along is that they don't matter. As Thank always, you, we will continue to support our Phoenix. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Our next speaker this evening is Amy Gibson. Amy Gibson, you have two minutes. Hello. While I appreciate the timely email sent out this morning to RISE parents, I still have many more questions, as do others who could not be here tonight. What would be helpful is before the next email update, if we could have a question and answer session and a, an opportunity for our RISE parents to have two-way communication with the district and get some of these questions that we have had for a very long time answered. For example, my incoming kindergartner, will she have the opportunity to participate in Summer Ignite? The district has scheduled this for our first week of school, and there is no indication that there was any consideration of the schools on an extended schedule. We are still waiting. We have reached out to the school who is waiting on you all to tell them what dates our children will be able to get this very important experience, getting them ready for their first year in public schools. Another example, I was unable to attend the Pine Meadows Neighborhood Association meeting where FCPS, architects, and city engineers were present to answer questions about the new RISE location. I heard it was very informative and that a different estimated completion date was given. It is frustrating that RISE parents have not had the same opportunity to ask questions or be provided the same information that external members of our community have been provided. I probably won't have enough time here to ask all of my questions, but I'll run through a few more. Is there an objective plan for when our pause on the middle school will be lifted? What goals or milestones must be met? Why were parents not informed that RISE is not meeting expectations prior to the middle school pause? What measures of growth and success were used to determine changes that are needed? If the school's test scores are poor, why have parents not been made aware of this and why are they not able to see an action plan like you have available for all other FCPS schools? When will the newly promised improvements be realized? Can we expect any improvements to be made for the current students this year? Will the district be prepared to implement them with our July 30th school year start? Thank you. Thank you for your time, Ms. Gibson. Our next speaker this evening is Jessica Chapman. Jessica Chapman. Ms. Chapman, you have two minutes. I'm a parent of a fifth grader who has been a part of RISE since 2021. I was present for the meeting with you, Dr. Liggins, where we learned that our girls, our hardworking girls, would no longer be able to call RISE home. Not only did I become very emotional, I sat in the front row crying my eyes out. I never imagined that my child would be kicked out of the school that she was so proud to represent. During the meeting, I kept hearing the focus, during the meeting, I kept hearing that the focus needs to be on K through five for RICE. But where does that leave our girls who've been there from the beginning? Placing a, pro placing a pause on opening up sixth grade does more than just kick them out. It tells them that they are not valued that their education does not matter, and that the promise of RISE no longer means anything. I personally don't understand how anyone can do this to these girls. 
if this was your children, your grandchildren, you would be furious. You would be ready to just, you would be upset. Thank you for your time. And I yield the rest of my time to the next speaker. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Our next speaker this evening is Jessica Chapman. I have two minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, Ronald Lydian, I'm sorry. Our next speaker this evening is Ronald Lydian. You'll have two minutes and 30 seconds. I would like to uh, yield my time to uh, Jamie Hurt. I'm sorry, sir. Who did you say? Jamie. Hurt. Jamie. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Beth Jones. Okay. Our next speaker this evening then is Clinton Hurt. I'd like to yield my time to Jamie Hurt. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hurt, that would be eight minutes and 30 seconds. I won't need that much time, thank you. <laughs> I first want to thank the board and Superintendent Leggins for your work. Should I wait? Yeah, sure. I'm excited. Okay, go ahead. I first want to thank the board and Superintendent Leggins for the work that you do to ensure the success of our students. Your job is not easy, and we can't do it without you. Thank you. The RISE STEM Academy for Girls program was created, a cutting edge STEM girl power program. Incredible, yes, we were inspired, invited to apply, grateful to be accepted, welcomed wholeheartedly, and we formed a family. We did COVID together, celebrated babies being born, mourned the loss of our school nurse, lived our lives together, and have learned so much. The Tuesday meeting in our cafeteria at RISE was poorly executed at best, a rescue aid pallet delivery amidst the dumpster fire of this failed experiment. We were told that sixth grade was paused, actually canceled effectively. District leadership wants to focus on K through five, retrain the staff, and make it a world-class program. Little action to be, little action to make it right by this current inaugural class of girls who have had the rug pulled out from under them. Having been previously championed and told, you matter, you're powerful, capable, and worthy. Now, you're not performing, the program made of real people, mind you. Our children and the staff I have come to adore is mediocre, low quality, low value, and low ability. Sorry it didn't work out for you. We'll work hard to do right by the next set of kids. Do more with less is the message we have received again and again. I've personally leveled up through the five stages of grief over the loss of this opportunity we were promised in the school family we've come to love. Denial, is this even legal? Anger, making the shirts we wore to spark and wondering why, why would he say those things? Bargaining, surely we can make this work somewhere else, anywhere else. Depression, doing what little we could to show our love to our people because we are all hurting. And acceptance, trying for the next best thing to what we've been promised, a STEM-focused education for our girls. I did have doubts about keeping my daughters in this program. What will sixth grade look like in a second dilapidated building with split resources and debated about making a plan B. Many of our families with homes in desirable zip codes with great rated schools have already returned to their home district at school as they can't bear to endure the neglect any longer. We held out because we love RISE, believe in the leadership within the walls of our building and believed in the promise that district leadership was committed to this program. My message to leadership tonight, you really blew it. 
both the lack of support over the years and the poor management of this reduction in service and the awful messaging to staff and families. As Taylor would say, say it in the street, it's a knockout. Say it in a Zoom, it's a cop-out. I'm disgusted by the recent turn of events and the disparaging comments and narrative over the program from district leadership after the years of neglect. This is an absolute travesty, and I'm just sick that the hearts of our staff are hurting as they have shown up and supported our girls throughout these difficult years. The staff has remained with us, the staff that has remained with us, show up because they love our girls, not because it's a comfy work assignment, because the people who wanted a comfy work assignment have already bailed. Uh, the people who are still with us are in it because they care about the kids. FCPS has rebranded in recent years, spared no expense, remarketing. It used to be about the kids. Our family has proudly worn purple and participated in every science fair, SPARC, STLP, presentation of learning, special program showcase. Uh, we've bragged about, promoted, and represented this program. We watched our Rise Girls be paraded about in what feels like a dog and pony show exploited for marketing purposes for years as it suited your narrative, and now you want to throw them away. Property taxes have been raised. The district has the money to provide for this program, yet her class is scrapped and she's been dismissed. As the parent of a beautiful, bright, and deserving current fifth grader from this first disposable class of girls, I also have the distinct predicament of having a current third grader at RISE who will be in the third disposable class with no middle school as an option. My heart hurts for the girls and families still holding on to hope for this program. Our family has been ride or die for RISE. However, my position has shifted to stand for RISE, walk with Jacobs. This program, without Jennifer Jacobs, by either her own interest or invitation by district leadership, is a bust. Jennifer Jacobs has led Rise with passion, professionalism, and has been a true and fierce advocate for the success of every scholar, even those whose parents don't show up and act crazy about things. And she really will be sorely missed. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our speakers. And that concludes those speakers who uh, spoke on items that are on the agenda. I will uh, let Eric know who asked about the uh, facilities plan. We, that will be coming up on the consent agenda, uh, including um, the Henry Clay project as well. Uh, next on our agenda is the approval of routine matters and motions in order to approve the minutes of the March 14th uh, 2024 planning meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education. Is there a motion to that effect? I will so move. Uh, motion by Board Member Moore. Is there a second? I second the motion. Second by Board Member Clark. Questions on approval of the minutes for March 14th. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. This time I'll attend a motion to approve our consent items as listed. Is there a motion? I move we approve the consent items as listed. Motion, motion by Board Member Green. Is there a second? I second the motion. Second by Board Member Clark. Question is on the approval of the consent items. Is there any discussion? And we did talk about some of these at the planning uh, work session, but Mr. Thompson, if you want to discuss any of the items that are on our uh, phased facilities plan, uh, feel free to, but uh, essentially it's what you covered at the planning session that we have some BG1s on here for the projects that are in phase one, if you just want to give a brief recap. Thank you, Chair Murphy. We are moving forward with the projects, as you indicated, uh, looking at our BG1 uh, for the initial construction at Henry Clay High School. Uh, that did start out as a renovation. Uh, we've been working with the board since the fall to get that modified to a new build. Uh, we had to go through amending our district facility plan. Uh, we recently completed that last month. It went through the State Board of Education or through the Department of Education was approved. And now we're bringing forward the initial BG1, which is a very preliminary estimate 
that basically outlines the project, uh, what the scope is in terms of a new build, and what the funding source is. So uh, tonight the board will approve that. That project will move forward and we will start our phases of the BG1s and working back and forth with you as a board of education in terms of moving that project forward. So uh, the other project is a preliminary uh, project for getting some demo done at the RISE uh, Girls STEM, uh, getting that site prepared when construction is ready to move forward with that. Uh, that will come back uh, with the board in terms of getting uh, construction documents prepared and moving that project forward as well. So we're making progress on both of those fronts and appreciate the board's support. Excellent, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. And then also a number of um, maintenance projects for HVAC repairs, which is that's, this is that balance in that plan of not only focusing on our new facilities, but maintaining our existing facilities. So there's about a, what, uh, $500,000 investment or so. Uh, certainly, uh, as you indicate, we, we have a very large footprint of over 70 facilities here in the uh, community, uh, roughly 1.8 billion in values that we have to build new and maintain as well. Mm -hmm. So we have about three schools that the board has recently approved in terms of new HVAC projects to make sure that those student learners have uh, comfort uh, during our heating and cooling season. So uh, moving those projects forward as well uh, with the nickel tax that was recently approved, it allows us to move forward with those maintenance projects and we appreciate those investments in the infrastructure because we have to maintain that balance as you indicated. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Any questions, board members? Okay, if there's no further discussion on the consent items, uh, the motion on the floor is approval of the consent agenda as listed. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. This time I'll turn the agenda back over to Superintendent Liggins to take us through our action items. Thank you, Chair Murphy. The only action item this evening is our monthly financial report. I uh, will ask Rodney Jackson to come forward. Good evening, everyone. This monthly report for the month of February 2024, you can see we're approximately $454.5 million and 300 million in expenses. Overall, we're about $154.5 million in net income. Comparing this year, last year, 154.4 versus 183 million. Combining all funds from one to 7,000, we received $724.7 million. Expenses, $460.6 million net increase in fund balance, $264.1 million. This report shows fund one general fund all the way through fund 7,000, which fiduciary funds matching at $264 million. The revenue, um, excluding begin, I mean, including beginning balance, excuse me, shows $454.5 million versus $458 million. This is $3.5 million less at this time. Comparing this year to last year, taking out the beginning balance, you will see $372 million versus $366.5 million which means we have $5.5 million more actually overall comparing year to year. Comparing expenses, um, 300 million this year versus 275 million, $25 million more. This is a breakdown showing all revenue, as you can see um, property taxes and all revenue resources are coming in. Utility taxes, we had a mild winter. Um, as you can see, we didn't have no snow primarily. I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Um, but hopefully it maintains and so with that's a reflection of the utility taxes what's going on there. On the expense side, um, salaries and benefits, um, salaries with the investment is primarily expense increase from this year. Um, again, good news report on investment, we're at $6 million so far and the next month I think it increases with another 500,000 so it would be at $6.5 million for investments for the year. Our general fund assets, 162.5 million versus liabilities, $8 million. Our financial position remains sound on these assets versus liabilities. Our encumbrances are approximately $10 million. If they become a reality, our fund balance will be $152.5 million. This reflects the um, trust funds and all trust funds have been presented accordingly. Looking at ERSA funds one, two, and three, ERSA one and two, of course, have been spent 100% and we've already um, liquidated all expenses related to related POs. ARP ESSER 3 is where we're at now. We have 89% spent, and this would be through September of this year. Safety tax, we received all the revenue related to that, and we're at 57% throughout the year. And again, as a reminder, um, although we're more than 57% of the year, excuse me, um, you have to be 
thinking about that we have the where we pay our payroll in June is that five checks instead of two, so we'll catch up at that time. Are there any questions or concerns? Any questions, board members? Okay. If there are no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to accept the monthly treasurer's report as presented. Is there a motion? I move we accept the monthly treasurer's report as as presented. Motion by Board Member Green. Is there a second? A second. Second by Board Member Moore. Questions on approval of the monthly treasurer's report. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Dr. Liggins. Thank you, Board Members. Under the informational items this evening, the agenda includes five written reports for your review, uh, the list of board committee assignments, the personnel changes for March, the school activity funds, the position control document, and our high school graduations for the spring, which are as follows. On Thursday, March 30th, 2024, we will have Lafayette High School graduation at 10 a.m., Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School graduation at 2 p.m., and Tate's Creek High School at 6 p.m. On Friday, May 31st, 2024, Frederick Douglass High School students will graduate at 10 a.m., followed by Bryan Station High School at 2 p.m., and finishing out our graduation schedule will be Henry Clay High School at 6 o'clock that evening. All six graduations will take place at the Central Bank Center in Rupp Arena. Uh, we're also excited to announce that we will not have to use any weather days to make up this year, and so our last day of school will be Wednesday, May 29th. And maybe I shouldn't have said that either, Rodney, <laughs> but um, assuming there's no snow coming. Knock on some wood. Um, we'll be posting the announcement about graduations and the last day of school um, on our social media and district website immediately. This time, I will turn the meeting back over to you, Chairman Murphy. We do have a need to go into closed session. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Liggins. And uh, we do have one speaker on an item that is not on the agenda, but we will invite them to speak at this time. Let me get my list back up here. And that is Janice Gilbert. Uh, Janice Gilbert. And the same, uh, same applies, although uh, you will have three minutes uh, to speak during this portion since you are our only speaker during this portion of the meeting. And just a reminder, you speakers will not be allowed to make any disparaging or critical remarks. And since items you'll be discussing are not on tonight's agenda, our board may or may not comment. So, um, Ms. Gilbert, you will have three minutes. My name is Janice Gilbert. I'm a product of Fayette County Schools. I'm a parent of a graduate of Fayette County Public Schools. I'm now a grandparent of a Fayette County School. That's three generations have been committed to this school system. I have, uh, I'm retired with 32 years in Fayette County Public Schools. I was uh, worked with, well, that doesn't count the five years I substituted, so that makes it 37. Anyway, long story short, I, I'm gonna try to make it quick. I taught predominantly uh, students in special education with learning and behavior problems. Last 17 years, I was a special education facilitator, achievement compliance coach, based on what they were called. Tonight, my comments address my own concern following the current incident of the undetected weapon at Fayette County High School, as well as a communication to the public following it. Okay, I'm dismayed that we're paying hefty sum out of tax dollars to a company who is reported who were hired to assist with security, but, fail, but at this time does not check backpacks for weapons due to time constraints. I believe they communicated that it took too long. Now, I'm not sure that's what's reported to me as a as a, a citizen. I'm doubly dismayed. Teachers are now being offered to be trained to locate and secure weapons, to check backpacks. Um, these are not, this should be done by professionals. This is not staff with level of training. And so when I heard that, uh, this also is reported. Uh, we, can we be creative? Ask our own members of law enforcement, what do they need? Can we, maybe they can train hired uh, retired police, retired uh, veterans, ask our professional law enforcement what they need to help them do this. I assume we want to provide them the same amount of security that I had coming into this building tonight when, you know, we checked for safety. My big second topic really is the, um, the response to the incidents. I've been tracking the last couple of these and the last few years, and here's what I hear comments. Now, this is according to the media, so I'm talking as a citizen. He didn't, we didn't think he'd use it. He, he or she was having peer problems in the neighborhood. 
And the last incident reported, he inadvertently brought the weapon and magazine in his backpack. How do you inadvertently do, that's unacceptable. I wanna say this, and I don't mean to be harsh and flippant, but I'm a gun owner. If I tonight, <clears throat> pardon me, had brought a gun and put it in my purse, I know for sure that your, our law enforcement would have me out on Old Frankfurt Pike with charges, and no one here would say, well, we didn't think she'd use it. So it's not acceptable that we have that in our high school, especially reporting to the media. It is not. Dr. Liggins, I'm understanding that you're addressing this with schools. I think that's, and I thank you for that. I really thank you as a citizen. Um, let's see, let's see. Um, a base, oh, okay. I'll email you the rest, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Ms. Gilbert. We appreciate it. Thank you. At this time, I will entertain a motion. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to make the agenda dated March 25th, 2024, on which action has been taken at this meeting. A part of the minutes is a copy of the minutes verbatim. Is there a motion to that effect? Well, before we do that, can I make a request? Board Member Ferguson, go ahead. Just in light of all the um, comments <coughs> from the RISE parents tonight, and because in October of last year, we had a capital funds request to for the annex for girls rise at Main Street. I mean, that money was committed to $2.153 million in capital outlay funds to purchase equipment and make building improvements to that to the annex building and that that would start in August of this year. I mean, I don't know if that money has been promised for something else, but I would like to request that it is used to address the concerns that are present at the current building. At least part of that money would be used for that. If not all of it. Well, we'll, we'll certainly get a report on that. Those, the construction had begun at the other, or has begun and is at the other building. And so um, we'll get you where we're at at that point. We, members of the public, please refrain from making comments during the board meeting. Please refrain from making comments during the board meeting. <laughs> Dr. Liggins, you may continue. I'm sorry, it does say starting August will be housed there. So obviously, yes, so obviously the work started before then. I'm yeah, sorry. so we are utilizing the funds are currently to, are up until recently, to actually do the reconstruction at the annex for sixth grade for girls. But we can certainly get you um, an update. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liggins, and we will be looking forward to that update. Thank you, Board Member Ferguson. Um, the question, uh, again, the motion is to make the agenda dated March 25th, 2024, on which action has been taken this meeting. A part of the minutes is if copied in the minutes verbatim. Is there a motion to that effect? I so move. Motion by Board Member Clark. Is there a second? A second. Second by Board Member Moore. Questions on approval? of making the agenda dated March 25th, 2024, a part of the minutes of copy the minutes verbatim. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries 5-0. As Dr. Lincoln indicated, we do have a need to enter a closed session pursuant to KRS 61.810, section one, paragraph K. Meetings required to be conducted in privacy by law and KRS 156.557, section six, paragraph C, preliminary discussions related to the evaluation of the superintendent and KRS 61.810, section one, paragraph B, to discuss the seller acquisition of real property, the board will reconvene an open session if necessary, take any action required pursuant to discussions conducted during closed session. This time I'll entertain a motion to enter closed session for the stated reasons. Is there a motion? I move we enter closed, ses closed session for the stated reasons. Motion by board member Green. Is there a second? A second. The motion. Second by board member Clark. Questions on entering closed session for the stated reasons. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0, it's 8-10 p.m. The board is in closed session. We'll reconvene in open session and take any action if necessary.
I don't think that's necessarily.
I know. I don't want one of those rain jackets. Those are nice. Are we good? Okay. A good afternoon, everyone. The board, uh, or evening, whatever it is. It's afternoon somewhere. Uh, the board left closed session on a motion by Board Member Clark, a second by Board Member Moore. The vote was 5 0 at 9 34 p.m. Uh, no action being necessary. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting of the Clayton County Board of Education. Is there a motion? I so do. I mean, I so move that we adjourn the meeting. Motion by Board Member Clark. Is there a second? I second. Second by Board Member Moore. Questions on adjournment? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. We stand adjourned. Thank you all. And have a great spring break.